Welcome to worship here at St. John's this weekend. I'm excited to launch a new sermon series with you called Practicing Christian. I want to draw your attention to the graphic that we're using throughout this series because I feel like it's fitting. There's a Bible, which is really the playbook for our lives. And then there's a set of shoes. See, the Bible is something that's meant to be put into practice. Even Jesus says this in Matthew chapter 7, as he talks about the wise man who built his house on the rock. He says, it's the person who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice. It's not enough to read your Bible. It's not enough to know your Bible. We want to put it into practice. We want to put it into action in our lives. We're learning and we're living it out. So throughout the next seven weeks, I'm going to share with you seven different practices that you can live out in your Christian life. Thanks for joining us this weekend. I pray this time of worship is a blessing to you, that it draws you closer to Christ, even as he draws close to you. It truly is all about Jesus. God's word is clear that we are to seek his will and his ways above our own. And so we place his name above our names as we gather together in this time of worship. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Sometimes it is a battle of wills, though. I don't know if you've ever been involved in one of those in a relationship. Who's going to give 
and and you're battling against each other. And sometimes in our lives, it seems like we're in a battle of the wills with God. And we want our way rather than his way. And so we need to take some time tonight to confess that, to admit that before our God. So join me in this prayer of confession. Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have failed to do. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been Help us amend what we are and direct what we shall be so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In that prayer of confession, once again, we were submitting ourselves to God's will. To hear those final concluding words, so that we may delight in your will. What does that look like in our lives to delight in God's will as we ask ourselves, what is God's will for our lives? Well, Luther says in his catechism that God's will comes as we live holy lives here in time and there in eternity. God's will comes as we confess Jesus as our Lord and Savior. God's will comes as we confess our need for him in our lives because God's will is that no one would perish but that everyone would come to everlasting life. And so it's my joy, it's my delight to announce that God in his mercy forgives you all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The reading for today is found in Luke 9, verses 22 through 25. And Jesus said, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law. And he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Then he said to them all, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit his very self? This is the word of the Lord.
Let's pray. Father, you know our tendency to assert our own will, to desire our own ways, and yet help us as we live out the Christian life to continue to learn what it means to surrender, to submit ourselves to your will, knowing that your ways are good and best for us. In your name we pray. Amen. So we're beginning a new sermon series this fall called Practicing Christian. And I want us to think for a moment as we gather about what it means to practice something. Because to practice something is to repeatedly perform a certain skill in order to improve your proficiency. So we talk about somebody being a practicing attorney. And... And what does that mean? It means that they're working on cases, that, that they're spending time with clients and they're staying up to date on the latest laws, all with the goal that they can become better at their craft. Or we talk about how somebody is a, a practicing physician. And what does that mean? It means that they're, they're working with patients, they're performing surgeries, they're learning all of the latest techniques so that they can become better at what they do. In either situation, it's not enough to have your name on a door or your name on a diploma that hangs on your wall. Instead, they're committing themselves to a certain routine, a certain rigor in order to improve what they do. It's about practicing. And shouldn't it be the same when it comes to the Christian life? See, it's not enough to be a professing Christian. God calls us to be practicing Christians. It's not enough uh, if somebody asks you what your religious affiliation is to, to mark in the box that you're a Christian or you're a Lutheran. It's not enough to have your name on the membership roles of, of a certain church. No, the desire is that we are learning and living out the ways of Jesus in our lives. To be a Christian, it, maybe a better word is to be a disciple. And what is a disciple? A, some, a disciple is someone who is committed to the ways of Jesus. This is the way that the Apostle Paul talks about it in Philippians chapter 4. He says, Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, no, notice the next phrase, put it into practice it's this rhythm of learning and living of listening and applying yourself to what you have heard learning and living learning and living that's the rhythm of the christian life 
That's what it means to be a practicing Christian. And so over the next couple of months, uh, we're going to look together at seven different practices, seven different patterns, seven different habits, behaviors of the Christian life that we can begin to put into practice regularly in our Christian lives, all with the intent of becoming better in what God calls us to be. So the first practice that we want to talk about in our time together is the practice of surrender. Life as a practicing Christian is a life of learning daily to surrender. Now, maybe you have an image that comes to mind when you think of someone surrendering. Maybe it's that white flag moment where the soldiers put down their weapons, where the warfare stops, and where that, that white flag is raised, and they come out with their hands up and they admit defeat. Or maybe when you think of surrender, you think of another hands in the air moment. It's when that criminal is cornered by the cops and he knows that it's not worth running away. He's caught and he puts his hands in the air. And he's willing to accept a rest. You know, either image that you use for surrender, I'm not sure that I like either. Like, I'm not convinced that I'm really a big fan of surrender. To me, surrender seems weak. To me, surrender seems un-American. Surrender means that I admit that I lost. And I personally don't like to be a loser when it comes to anything. And yet, this is the first practice of what it means to be a Christian. It means that we are willing to repeatedly surrender ourselves to the will of God. I want to invite us to look at words that Jesus says in Luke chapter 9, verses 23 and 24. He says, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will save it. Now, he doesn't use the word surrender here, but he does use three words that are similar, three words that we might use to summarize what it means to surrender. Pay attention to the verbs, the imperatives that Jesus uses. First of all, he says that we are to deny ourselves. The word deny means to tell somebody no. Which nobody really wants to hear, do they? I mean, think of a little kid. How many times do you have to tell a little kid no? No, you can't do that. No, you can't put that in your mouth. No, you can't go there. It's like constant throughout the day. And how do they respond when they hear that word no? They throw a fit. They don't want to hear about it. Does it get any better when we become adults? Do any of us really like to hear the word no? And yet, that's what a life of denial is. It's a willingness to say no. No to our selfish ways. No to the worldly pleasures that are around us. But we say no so that we can say yes. We say no to ourselves so that we can say yes to God. To deny ourselves is really about prioritizing God. We deny ourselves so that we can defer to him, to his will, to his ways for our lives. The second verb, the second imperative that he uses is to take up. To take up means that you accept something. 
in your life. You embrace it in your life. You're willing to carry it. Now, I don't know if you've ever had one of these moments where a friend or a family member comes up to you and they say, close your eyes and put out your hands. Uh, maybe you're a little bit leery when that happens. Because I'll tell you what's happened to me. You close your eyes, you put out your hands, and something disgusting is put in it. And at that moment, here's what I do. I try to shove it back in their face. This is what we're tempted to do when we see what Jesus invites us to take up. He says, take up your cross. Uh, Jesus, I know what a cross is. A cross is about suffering. A cross is about pain. And I'm not sure that I want that in my life. So thanks a lot, Jesus. You can keep that. You can have that. I don't want it. But a life of surrender is not only willing to say no to the worldly pleasures, it's willing to say yes to pain. Yes to suffering. Because that's what Jesus has done for us. You see, if you you look back a few verses earlier, Jesus actually hints at his suffering and his death on the cross. Actually, he doesn't hint at it. He just outright says it for the first time to his disciples. He says, all right, guys, let me just cut it straight with you. We're going to go up to Jerusalem, and I'm going to be rejected and arrested and killed. Jesus is willing to carry that cross. He's willing to surrender to the will of God. And here's why. Because he knows that there's purpose in the midst of that pain. He knows that God is at work for good in the midst of that suffering. He knows that God is ultimately going to save the world. Is going to save you and I through that painful moment of taking up the cross so if we are willing to follow Jesus we are willing to accept suffering in our lives because we know what God is going to do through it he's going to work that pain out for a purpose he's going to conform us to Christ through that and on the other side of death and defeat there's victory So deny yourselves, take up your cross, and then the last imperative that Jesus mentions is follow me. This means that we're willing to allow God to determine the direction of our life. This means that we're willing to give up control and defer to him. Let me ask you a question. When you hop into a car, what seat do you prefer to sit in? I'll tell you where I prefer to sit. I like the driver's seat. I like to be the one who's in control. I like to be the one who says, this is where we're going and this is how we're getting there. And even if you take me out of the driver's seat, I'm a little bit of a back seat or a passenger seat driver. I want to be in control. And yet the Christian life, the life of a disciple, is ultimately one of deferring to Jesus. Of letting him be the one that determines the direction of our life. Because you look at a first century disciple. And a disciple was someone who was willing to follow the rabbi. In fact, they followed the rabbi anywhere. If the rabbi went a certain direction, that's where they went. If the rabbi stopped somewhere, that's where they stopped. If a rabbi talked to somebody, that's what they did. If a rabbi went to the bathroom, seriously, there are books written about this, that's exactly what a disciple did. It seems like a little bit too much, but this is the image that Jesus is getting at when he says, follow me. He says, release control to me. Let me be the one who determines the pace and the path of your life and trust that I am good. 
you look at these three different verbs and the thread that ties them all together is the will of God. Because this is what practicing surrender means. It means submitting ourselves daily to the will of God. Whether you know it or not, every day you wake up and you make a decision. You whisper a prayer. Either my will be done or thy will be done. Every day you wake up and you think, hmm, what do I want to do? Or you pause and you pray and you say, God, what are you calling me to do today? How can I follow your will for my life? That's the only two choices that we have. It's either my will or your will. And a life of surrender is one of consistently waking up every day and saying, God, your will be done, which is exactly what we pray in the Lord's Prayer. And in the end, when we defer to God's will, we let him be the one in the battle of the wills. We let him be the one that wins out. And, and, and here's the crazy thing. When you let God win out, what actually looks like losing to the world, and that's what a life of surrender looks like to the world, it looks like losing, it looks like defeat, but what looks like losing to the world is actually winning for the Christian. Look at verse 24 again. Jesus says, for whoever wants to save their life, in other words, whoever wants to hold on to their life, whoever wants to assert their own will, whoever wants to pursue their own pleasures, whoever wants to do whatever makes them happy, if someone chooses to live that way, they'll actually lose it. But whoever loses their life for me, whoever surrenders their will to me, we'll save it. So maybe surrender is not about defeat. Maybe surrender is about victory. You, you know, here, here's something that, that as I thought about that this week, I realized. The sign of surrender is putting your hands up, right? But that same sign of surrender and of defeat is actually also a symbol of victory, isn't it? What does somebody do when they win? They put their hands up. And so you can look at Jesus and those same arms that were pinned to a cross as he surrendered to the will of God what looked like defeat, those same arms in the resurrection were actually raised in victory. And so for us in our lives, when we're willing to do that same thing, when we're willing to put our hands up and surrender them to God's will, what looks like losing to the world is actually winning from God's perspective. So as we wrap our time together up, I, I want to give you a simple practice this week that you can begin to implement in your life so that you can live that life of surrender. And I'll admit, it, it might make some of you a little bit uncomfortable. I don't know, may, maybe for some of you it, it's going to bring back a bad memory from the past uh, where you had an encounter with the law. And someone told you, put your hands up. Because that's what I'm going to ask you to do this week. I'm going to ask you every morning as you get up and go about your day to put your hands in the air. You know what? We're not going to wait until this week. We're going to practice this here right now. So put your hands in the air. And as you do that every morning, I want you to repeat after me this simple prayer. God, I surrender to you. Your will be done. It's that simple. Every morning, 
hands up. God, I surrender to you. Your will be done. That's what it looks like to be a practicing Christian. It's a life of daily surrendering to his will. As you do that this week, may you realize that that's not a sign of defeat. It's a sign of victory through Jesus. Amen. Let's join together then in confessing our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We turn to our Lord in prayer after each petition saying, Lord, in your mercy, and I invite you to respond, hear our prayer. Father, we do place ourselves at your mercy as we surrender our lives once again to you. As we put our hands up, as we take our hands off of our own way of doing things, and instead invite you to take over control in our lives, to direct our footsteps, to guide us according to the truths of your word so that we might live out your will for our lives. Lord, in your mercy. And in that, Lord, you know the battles that we face. Help us to, to choose our battles wisely to know who we are fighting against, the devil, the world, and our sinful flesh. And Lord, when we find ourselves fighting against you, help us to step back, to submit, to surrender, knowing that if we're fighting a battle against you, we're always going to end up on the losing end. But if we're fighting a battle with you, we will win. Lord, in your mercy. Father, as we talk about living that life of surrender, it brings up these images of the military and of the police. And so we, we pray for them knowing that they are in need of our prayers, knowing that there are battles that are being fought, and we pray that your will would be done in that. We pray for, for injustices that are present in the world. We pray for people to reach the point where they're willing to raise that white flag, where they're willing to put their hands in the air and stop fighting, Surrender. Surrender to the justice system. Surrender to you. That they would change their lives and begin to conform them to your will. So give courage and boldness to those in our military and our law enforcement so that they would continue to do what is right. Lord, in your mercy. Lord Jesus, you call us all to a life of discipleship, to a life of, of learning and living. Thank you that we have the opportunity this fall to launch or relaunch groups and studies and Sunday school. And I pray, Lord, that as we're led to participate in that, that you would not only allow us to learn, but that you would 
encourage us to put what we learn into practice. Lord, in your mercy, each of these prayers, then Lord, we lift up to you in the name of your son Jesus as he's taught and invited us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Hello, members of St. John's. Pastor Josh and the finance team asked me to share my thoughts on giving and why I financially support the mission and ministry here at St. John's. I am a lifelong member of St. John's. I was baptized and confirmed here. I attended St. John's School, kindergarten through eighth grade. My three children also attended St. John's School. I am very blessed to call St. John's NYA my church home and family. I am grateful to my parents who brought me to church and provided me a Christ-centered education. I am thankful to the teachers and pastors who invested their time and energy into sharing Christ with me. They instilled the discipline and love of being in God's word daily and taught me not only to rely on his promises, but to watch for and to appreciate God's blessings each and every day. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. There was a time in my life when life was hard, really hard. I wondered, how in the world am I going to do this? How will the mortgage get paid? Will I be able to provide for my children? Because of the foundation of faith instilled in me at an early age, I chose to rely on God's promises. He promised to meet my needs. He says, look at the birds flying about. They neither plant nor harvest. Do they gather food into barns? Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Aren't you worth more than they are? It was not easy, but somehow the mortgage got paid. Somehow my children grew up. We had a roof over our heads and food to eat. Through it all, the Lord promised to bless me and keep me and give me peace. And you know what? He did. He did bless me. He did keep me. He did give me peace. Through it all, the Holy Spirit strongly convicted me to give financially to St. John's. I see giving as my Christian duty to give as I am able and even challenge myself at times. I am reminded of the parable of the rich fool found in Luke chapter 12, where Jesus tells the story of a rich man who built bigger and bigger barns to store his riches so one day he could take it easy, eat, drink, and be merry, and forgetting the need of his neighbor. I don't want to be the rich fool. The Lord has blessed me in so many ways through St. John's, and I want others to receive the same blessings. Therefore, I give financially to support the mission and ministry of Christ here at St. John's. What better mission and ministry than what we have right here in front of us? Our church and school, staff, and the members of St. John's working together to lay a foundation of faith in Christ. We are blessed to have a beautiful church and an outstanding school. We are blessed to have talented, dedicated staff. We are blessed to be able to come together and weekly worship to hear God's word with others. As we come together to learn, love, lead, and live for Jesus, he gives me, all of us, reassurance and rest in the midst of this busy, complicated and messy world. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. God is good. So as we go forth then to live that surrendered life, submitting to the will of God, may you know that God is good. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he look upon you with favor and give you now and always his peace. Amen.